Okay. Um, well, everyone, thank you so much for getting on. Um, I think we're going to get started. First, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Kelsey Lamp, and I'm the Oceans Advocate with Environment America Research and Policy Center. Environment America Research and Policy Center is dedicated to protecting our air, water, and open spaces. We investigate problems, craft solutions, educate the public and decision makers, and help the public make their voices heard in local, state, and national debates over the quality of our environment and our lives. At the outset, I wanna say that there are many important events happening in the world right now. And like many others, I have been moved by the passion and courage of activists taking to the streets. With that said, the threats facing our ocean are still pressing. And so I wanted to take a second here at the beginning to thank everyone for joining us today to hear about our oceans and what we can do to protect them. I hope today's discussion will give you a better understanding of the threats facing our ocean and how we can act to protect our ocean for generations to come. Uh, so a little background on me. As a child, I loved trips to the ocean. Growing up in Nevada, the salty breeze of the ocean was an amazing contrast to the dry and dusty nature I saw day to day. The beaches I visited on our family vacations were full of wonder and mystery, from anemones and starfish we saw in tide pools to the sand dollars we found on the beach and the seals we saw bobbing in the distance. I always have marveled at the life under our sea. Unfortunately, that world of wonder today faces threats that could change our oceans forever. Oil and gas drilling, climate change, and overfishing have all taken their toll on ecosystems and habitats that make up a healthy ocean. Today, we'll talk about some of those threats, but focus mostly on one of the tools we have to help protect and maintain healthy oceans, marine protected areas. These sanctuaries in our oceans are like national parks on land. They preserve habitats and wildlife, and if used properly, can help build resilience in the global ocean. That's why we'll also be talking about the ideas that we need to set a bold target to protect more of our oceans. We'll learn about the global movement to protect 30% of our oceans and to talk about what that might mean here in the US. We'll hear how communities can participate in designating marine protected areas. And we'll hear about one of the US's most magnificent marine protected areas, Papa Hanau Makuakea Marine National Monument. On today's webinar, we'll hear first from Lance Morgan, president of the Marine Conservation Institute, on the science behind marine protected areas and what 30% by 2030 could look like. Then we'll hear T. Ray Holm, a strategic planner who's worked in conservation for over 30 years, talk about the marine protected areas initiatives she's worked on around the Pacific and how communities can make an impact on designations. Finally, we're we'll hear from Maria Carnival, co state co-manager of Papa Hanau Makuakea Marine National Monument, about the commitments we've made to this amazing place and how those protections have inspired understanding and change. Finally, we'll wrap up with a Q&A and tell you how you can help us protect more of our oceans. Uh, if you have any questions while we're going, feel free to put them in the chat box. Um, we'll answer questions at the end um, and have an opportunity to ask all of your questions to these experts. So um, I wanna hand it over to Lance Morgan, um, who will kick us off with the science behind marine protected areas um, and a little bit more of a global perspective. Lance, if you wanna unmute yourself. Okay, great. Um, thank you, Kelsey, for the introduction and the opportunity to be here with everyone today. And thank you all for joining us on World Oceans Day. Do you want to go to the first slide? Um, I have been with Marine Conservation Institute for the last 20 years of my career. Um, a lot of that work focused on answering the question of why do we need MPAs and then helping to advocate for MPAs around the world um, about 10 years ago, a little bit less than 10 years ago, I became uh, president of the organization and now lead our work. But we were uh, one of those advocates for Papa Hanamo Kuake in the day, and I'm really pleased to be here on the panel today uh, with everyone to hear more about that uh, really spectacular area. Next slide, please. Uh, 
So I think if you've been paying attention, um, the sad news is you'll know that we are not only in a biodiversity and climate crisis, but with our uh, kind of recognition of COVID and our relationship to nature, um, we have this other newer crisis, nature crisis. And so we really do need to find a way to respect nature much more as we move forward. Next slide. Uh, we all are aware of many of the benefits we get from oceans, from um, food and livelihoods to coastal protection to now increasingly blue carbon, things like mangroves, et cetera. Um, and the fact that you know a healthy ocean really is fundamental to a healthy planet and really does provide us many of these um, benefits, both at local levels to global levels that we need for the planet to be habitable. Next slide. Uh, unfortunately, we've done our best to um, take marine life out of the oceans and probably too much ocean out of the oceans, too much, excuse me, fish out of the oceans for too long. And we really need to think about how do we rebuild um, these populations. So marine protected areas are one strategy for rebuilding populations. Next. Unfortunately, it isn't always just the things we're targeting. We all know about bycatch and the things we waste in the process of fishing. Next slide. We often um, are unaware of some of the, the you know, thousand year old corals and the habitat destruction that we have um, created on the bottom of the oceans in many places around the world. Um, things that just are unlikely to recover on human time scales, if ever. Next. And if that weren't enough, um, we're just increasingly industrializing the ocean. And one of the, the next great opportunities for business and industrialization is deep seabed mining. And you can see a picture of what one of these instruments would look like on the seafloor. And it really would just be the same thing we see on land, just a complete you know, destruction of the habitat. Next. So relatively little of the ocean remains uh, unimpacted. You can see the, the highest threat areas in this map are in red. Um, and really the lowest impacts are a very small percentage. Um, and, and even those areas are still impacted to some extent by our activities. Next slide, please. So we do have um, a proven strategy, uh, marine protected areas can rebuild populations and we can restore uh, healthy oceans if we can uh, establish enough of these areas quickly enough to actually address these issues. Um, an MPA, as was said, is really just like a national park. It's a well-defined area in the ocean in which we manage to um, try to ex exclude extractive activities as much as possible, but really um, manage the oceans as well as we can. Next slide. Um, Ten percent of the ocean has been agreed to be protected under some international treaties, both the Convention on Biological Diversity as well as the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, we are at the deadline in 2020 and closing in on the, the first 10 percent for the oceans. Um, but we also recognize this is only a milestone and we really are viewing this as an opportunity to, to uh, this year as an opportunity to reconfirm our commitment and then expand on this moving forward more towards a, a more appropriate target like 30%. Next slide. There is a lot of discussion about what an MPA actually is. It's an area that should be set aside to, to achieve long-term conservation. I think there's some if you hit the key, Kelsey, keep going. Um, the truth is MPAs are very wide in their diversity in terms of what they actually protect from and are protecting. Next slide. Um, we might think of it very simply as a boundary in which we don't fish and don't extract different things on one side and where we allow them to thrive on the other side. Next slide. But we often know that it actually runs a complete game from very little activity allowed to quite a bit of activity allowed. And this has a, a really big significance because as you allow more activities, you don't get necessarily the same conservation benefits. So while we think that an MPA could be 
a zone set aside for marine life and have some benefits. If we allow too much activity, we may not get all the benefits that we are hoping from. Next slide. We, as marine science, the marine science community have spent a lot of time trying to figure out what the variations are across these boundaries. And so you'll often hear a lot of discussion of what fully protected marine reserves are or the benefits that come from those. Um, things like spillover, larvae and adults that can move from the reserve and help rebuild populations outside. You might think about these as insurance um, areas where if we make a bad mistakes somewhere else, these populations can come and restore. Um, there's a lot of um, arguments for this. One of the most important, next slide please, is that the fish that grow bigger in reserves when they're not caught actually become much more fertile and can deliver an awful lot more larvae to the surrounding areas. So you'll, you'll often you know, hear about these really old fish. Well, while that's important, why that is important is that fish don't have kind of a linear increase in their egg output. They have an exponential increase. So even a fish that's just a little bit bigger can produce many, many times the amount of larvae. Um, and that's a, one of the benefits of not being fished. Okay, next slide. So this also is sometimes confusing because we often will talk about marine protected areas when we mean marine managed areas. So here's a picture, picture of the US and these are all the zones in which some sort of fishery management regulation um, might be in place. Next slide. But these are all the places where no fishing is allowed or no extraction, excuse me, when you kind of really think of it holistically. So you might only see a few small blue dots along the coastline because really less than 1% of our waters are in, in on the continental scale are in these types of zones. Next slide. But we do have marine national monuments. Most of them are in the Pacific. Unfortunately, you may have heard uh, President Trump just um, revoked the rules for the New England seamounts and canyons, which will now um, potentially have fishing re-allowed in them. But these are areas that are fully protected, are really achieving this high conservation standard that we're all looking for. Next slide. If you step back to the global stage, this is the blue areas are where we see the really strong protections, the full protection that I've been talking about. And the lighter blue are marine protected areas, but those zones that actually have some real conservation benefit. And if you looked at the hatching, those are areas that are about uh, to come on board in terms of their full implementation. Next slide, please. Uh, again, if we look at our progress towards this 10% target, um, and I should say this is a website, Marine Protection Atlas, MPA Atlas, that we house at Marine Conservation Institute. So we track these numbers and spend quite a bit of time doing that. But we have about five, a little over five and a half percent in a marine protected area of the global ocean right now. And we have about another two and a half to three percent that will be an MPA soon. So we still have a little bit of work to do here in 2020 to get to that 10 percent target. Next slide. Uh, and as I mentioned, there are now uh, increasingly calls from the IUCN and the scientists there, as well as marine scientists for 30% of the ocean protected as really being the, the benchmark that we all need to uh, reach. And there is uh, quite a bit of growing science about why that is the case. And then famous um, biologist E.O. Wilson has argued that we really need half of the planet set aside um, for wildlife to recover and, and be um, plentiful and abundant. Next slide. One initiative that we um, run at Marine Conservation Institute are, is the Blue Parks Initiative. Um, and I'm happy that Papa Hanaumokuake was one of the first Blue Parks. These are science-based standards that the um, MPA managers have to reach that really are not just about protecting biodiversity, but having effective management and having you know, good monitoring and having all those rules and tools and you know, obviously staff and funding are really critical components of this. So there's 16 of those places around the world at this point. Um, every year we evaluate many MPAs to keep going. Um, so we're looking to eventually get a whole global network of these places that really meet this fully protected criteria and actually have all the resources they need to effectively conserve our oceans. 
next slide. So that is the end of my presentation. Thank you all for your attention and the opportunity to speak with you um, wherever you are. And then please visit and provide us any feedback um, about this. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Lance. Um, next, we're going to be hearing from TRA Holm, a strategic planner who has worked to designate some of those um, marine protected areas across the Pacific. So um, I will make sure that she can unmute herself um, and turn it over. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, aloha, everyone. And thank you so much to Environment America. And um, thank you, Kelsey, for the introduction and Lance for that great presentation. And thank you to everyone that's um, joining the webinar today. I'm just going to share some stories um, from my experiences working with um, communities and stakeholders on designating MPAs, large MPAs, um, as well as um, small MPAs and um, regional MPA initiatives. Slide. Thank you. Um, what I'm hoping to do is really highlight some of the opportunities that exist with um, uh, the process for initiating the designation and design of MPAs, um, as well as managing MPAs. Um, I think we're aware of some of the um, opportunities that exist for conservation, for research, science, and education, and achieving our collective sustainability goals. But there are also other opportunities, real important, significant opportunities for enhancing values of these areas, economic values, as well as spiritual values and legacy values, in addition to the biophysical. Um, for example, um, just bringing together diverse stakeholders and groups to identify collective aspirations um, what are our hopes and dreams? Oftentimes when we're working in conservation um, with uh, uh, resource users, um, we may think that we disagree at, on, on, on goals and objectives, but um, MPA uh, designation gives us an opportunity, uh, an opportunity to bring folks together to identify collective aspirations. Um, also, there are opportunities to inspire stakeholders um, from diverse uh, sectors to take action to support marine conservation and conservation in general. Um, there are opportunities for creating space for diverse groups to collaborate and really learn from one another, um, not only about conservation aspirations, but aspirations in general. Um, in, in the Pacific, particularly in, in Polynesia, um, we have a concept, this concept of mana, which is um, it's sort of your um, spiritual influence, um, your strength. And um, I like to think that there is, is, is mana in the work that we are doing collectively to design, designate, and effectively manage um, MPAs. Right? Um, there's a concept that the Fijians use, they call it one salt water, and this concept really speaks to the idea that um, there really is one ocean, and this ocean um, links all of us, and it's reflected in a Hawaiian proverb that was shared with me by a colleague, um, Kalani Kyocho, who is a native Hawaiian specialist for Papahanaumokuakea. He um, shared this with me last year um, and also through a video that we worked together to produce. Um, and the Hawaiian proverb literally translates into the idea that the islands are strung together like a lei, like a flower lei by the ocean. But if you look at the deeper meaning, the kona, the hidden layers of meaning, um, this concept speaks to the idea that humanity is united by the ocean. I think that's something that we really have to remember and speak to when we're going through the process of initiating um, a designation for an MPA. Marine conservation and marine protected areas are part of our collective heritage. They really are the Pacific way, um, but they're also now our global pathway to economic and cultural safety. Right? Um, I'm going to give, I'm going to share some stories from a few different examples or case studies of MPAs, MPAs, MPA networks. Um, 
One is a very small uh, MPA called the Armas Conservation Marine Conservation Area. And then I'll speak to a couple of species specific national sanctuaries that were established. Um, and I will also talk about a national marine sanctuary that was uh, initiated. And then I'll talk about a regional uh, initiate, uh, initiative um, that was launched in 2006 to support um, 30 conserving, effectively conserving 30% of near shore marine areas. And this, this initiative was, it was called the Micronesia Challenge and it was inspired by Fiji. So you'll notice most of my experience um, has been um, in the Pacific, uh, in particular Lake Palau and, and Micronesia. So those are the, the stories that I'm going to share. Right? So the Nermas Conservation Area is located in Palau and it was established in 1998 really by the community through um, state legislation and traditional law. Um, in Palau, uh, traditional conservation law is referred to as bull. Bull is a moratorium on certain activities within a specific area or uh, on um, act, uh, activities to use a particular resource or species. Um, this is a very small conservation area. It's only just over three square kilometers of, of seagrass, mangrove, and patch reef but it also includes the nation's richest sea cucumber population. Um, as I mentioned, it was really designed, designated, and managed by the primary stakeholders, which in this case were the community, um, state and the traditional leaders, um, with support from um, the conservation community, both at the national level, as well as um, national and um, international uh, NGOs. The primary motivations for designating and managing this conservation um, are the economic values, including the subsistence values. And I think it's important to note here, as people go, why sea cucumbers? Sea cucumbers, um, a lot of people don't know, are the, in the Pacific, are the third most valuable fisheries resource, following tuna and pearls. So um, it is a very important marine resource for um, Pacific. Um, it was also designated because of the cultural value of the site, the spiritual value, as well as the biophysical values. And the community saw um, opportunities for aspirational livelihoods. And what I mean, mean by that is they saw it as an opportunity to create a platform for conservation careers to develop it within their community. Slide. Then we have the example of the Plow National Shark Sanctuary. The Plow National Shark Sanctuary was established in 2009 through presidential executive order. It was announced at the UN General Assembly that year and it was later supported through national legislation. It was the world's first um, national shark sanctuary and it prohibited all commercial shark fishing and finning within the nation's EEZ. This covered an area of um, 600,000 square kilometers or 230,000 square miles of ocean, about the size of France. Um, it was designed, designated, and managed by the primary stakeholders, which in, in that case was the national government in collaboration with the state and also with support, technical and financial support from bilateral and multilateral partners, along with local, national, and international NPOs. The primary motivations for designating and managing that sanctuary were the economic values of sharks to um, the, nation's, the nation's leading uh, industry, which was marine tourism, specifically dive tourism. Um, the economic value of sharks in Palau at that time um, for particularly sharks that frequent popular dive sites was approximately $1.9 million per individual. Um, so once we did that economic analysis and were able to communicate that to um, stakeholders, communities, we really saw the importance of establishing this area. Also, sharks play an important cultural role in addition to the biological values of sharks in Palau. Next slide. Then we have the Palau Marine Mammal Sanctuary. The Palau Marine Mammal Sanctuary was established in 2010, also through executive order from the president, and it was launched at COP10, the 10th Conference of the Parties to the United Nations Conference on uh, 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 
the Convention on Biological Diversity, which took place in Nagoya, Japan. And it was later supported by um, national and state legislation. Um, this uh, uh, sanctuary protected all, or protects all marine mammals within all of uh, Palau's waters from hunting, capture, and harassment. There's one exception. Um, there is a dolphin encounter facility that was established um, in the late 90s, and um, so that that facility was grandfathered in. Um, this sanctuary was designed and designated and managed also by primary stakeholders, national government, in collaboration with the tourism industry and with technical and financial support from uh, bilateral and multilateral partners, local, national, and international. And um, the primary motivations for establishing that MPA were the economic values. Obviously, marine mammal tourism is um, the fastest growing sector of marine tourism globally. Um, there, the cultural values for uh, Dugong, the population of Dugong in Palau is the most isolated um, population of Dugong in the world with only 200 individuals approximately. Um, and they carry uh, 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 significant cultural value. And then there was also political value in establishing that um, sanctuary and that um, the designation of that sanctuary helped to mitigate what was considered somewhat of a tarnished legacy, conservation legacy for Palau with regard to its voting record in the IWC, the International Whaling. Um, there were also considerable legacy values that were discussed at length, as well as the, the biological values. And for those of you, I, I think you all know what legacy values are, but it's just really the idea that we want our children and our grandchildren to all also live in a world where they can experience these species. Slide. Then we have the Palau National Marine Sanctuary. This was um, quite a significant undertaking. This was a sanctuary that was envisioned by uh, the president of Palau and was announced during in, in, in 2013 during a visit from Prince Albert of Monaco. Um, the, enabling, the enabling legislation uh, was passed in uh, 2015, and that legislation went into full effect in Palau just this past January. Um, it prohibits all commercial fishing and mining activities in about 80% of Palau's national waters. Um, it was also designated and managed, I would say, by primary stakeholders and national government in collaboration with states and uh, fisheries and tourism. Um, and that sanctuary has also gotten a lot of support, technical and financial support from bilateral and multilateral partners, as well as local, national, and international. This um, National Marine Sanctuary, by the way, rolled up the Palau Shark Sanctuary and the Marine Mammal Sanctuary into one legislative piece. The primary motives for um, the establishment of this sanctuary were the conservation, because significant conservation values, um, the economic values, and I think for the most part, especially for uh, communities in Palau, and I would say even with our global partners, the legacy values um, that were associated with, with, um, the, with that site. Slide. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the Micronesia Challenge as well. The Micronesia Challenge was an initiative. It's not an MPA, but it was an it was an initiative that was launched at the eighth conference of the parties to the UN uh, Convention on Biological Diversity in Curitiba, Brazil, in 2006. This is basically a shared commitment by all Micronesian countries and territories to effectively conserve at least 30% of nearshore and 20% of terrestrial resources. I really um, want to know, because this often gets lost um, when we discuss Micronesia Challenge and a variety of uh, platforms, that originally the Micronesia Challenge was inspired by an earlier commitment made by Fiji who also conserve 30% of their areas. And the springboard, the platform for that was really as a result of community-based MPAs um, supported through the LMMA network, the Locally Managed Marine Air, um, Network. And so these are um, a, a collective network of, of small MPAs that really provided that platform for 
need you to go, hey, you know, we think we can achieve 30% near shore areas. Um, and so we're going to throw down uh, the gauntlet. And so that inspired the Micronesia Challenge. Um, Micronesia Challenge is linked to sustainable finance goals um, to support marine conservation. Um, so uh, sustainable finance mechanism was one of the, um, the, the, the most important uh, initial uh, uh, goals and strategies for achieving um, uh, what was envisioned for the Micronesia Challenge. Um, this is managed through a regional mechanism, the Micronesia Conservation Trust. And in each country and territory, each country and territory establishes its own implementation mechanism. In Palau, the implementation mechanism to achieve its obligation to the Micronesia Challenge is the Palau Protected Areas Network. So just a few lessons um, that uh, you know, I, I think are important uh, to remember or that resonate with me and hopefully they might resonate with some of you and um, that is that MPAs small medium or large they are all important and I know that there is this we are you know as a global community uh, striving towards achieving our 30% uh, goals um, and so we are really aiming for large-scale marine protected area establishment and that's really important but um, small uh, MPAs are also very, very important. So size does matter, but don't forget small MPAs can inspire um, the effective um, designation and management of the larger. Um, I think it's important to, when you're uh, thinking about designating uh, an MPA, um, or you're looking at a site that uh, needs MPA designation, to engage all primary stakeholders. Um, and, and remember indigenous, indigenous communities. Um, I think that's really important, early rather than later. And um, in the process of engaging uh, primary stakeholders, um, I think it's important to approach um, uh, stakeholders with a spirit of uh, respect and requesting advice and support, presenting the problem, the aspiration, looking to um, the stakeholders and communities for advice and support, participation and leadership, as opposed to just kind of inviting them to the table. Kind of like if you're gonna go into someone's home and um, you know decide to throw a party, you don't just invite them to the party, you know, you have a conversation with them first um, to get things started. Um, and it's, it's, it's really important, I think, um, early on as well, to invest financial and human resources in establishing and strengthening diverse partnerships, local, national, internet, international, as well as across all sectors, industry, health, education, media, and finance. Um, you're gonna need all of that expertise um, with um, designating and, and managing. Um, and I think finally, this is a concept that um, was introduced to me back in the 90s, and it's always stayed with me. And it's just to remember that, um, you know, in many ways, we're really managing ecosystems as opposed to ecosystems. You know, the ecosystems will do fine without us if we didn't exist. What we're really managing is human behavior. Um, and so just keeping that in mind and that, um, uh, you know, bringing people to the table early on, um, uh, uh, approaching all stakeholders with respect is really a key component of successfully designating, designing, and uh, effectively managing. Okay. Slide. And that's it. Mahalo nui loa, masulam, and thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that was really fascinating and I love ecosystems. Definitely going to keep that in mind. Um, so finally, we'll hear from Maria Carnavale, who's the co-manager of Papahanao Makuakea Marine National Monument about one of the US's Pacific uh, marine protected areas. So Maria, I'm unmuting you now. Hi. Can everyone hear me okay? You're a little broken up actually, Maria. 
Thanks. Oh, let's get real close. Is that okay? Yes. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, well, thank you to Environment America, Kelsey, Michaela, and Asians. I was so engaged, I forgot that I would actually be providing one. <laughs> um, so, aloha everyone. I'm here to talk to you about Papa Hanamukuaki Emory National Monument. I represent the state of Hawaii and I've had the privilege and responsibility of being the site manager for just now nine years. I've worked in Hawaii and marine conservation for nearly the last 20, um, but was born and raised in Rhode Island. And it was through my connection of the ocean and enjoying lobster and lifeguarding at on a shoreline yacht club that has just um, really set the stage for me to be able to, to work um, within my passion and take care of our oceans. Next slide. Um, so I was hoping to share with you all today, um, this is a melee that um, was composed in modern times uh, from one of my former colleagues and he wove together some traditional elements and traditional language and included um, some of the areas of Papa and Amukuekea. It's a way we ground ourselves ahead of um, some of the meetings that when we come together. And so as we come together in this digital world, um, I was hoping that you would um, also enjoy it. Uh, you can actually clap along. It'll start with a clap with a beat and that's probably the easiest way that um, if and also you can um, try the Hawaiian language as, as well. And so um, let's get started. So this is Puka Maikala Kamukahi. Puka Maikala i Kumukahi Laea Avelo Pana i Le Pua Laea E Wai Aloha Kamakani Laea yeah, thank you. So, um, so it actually took us from the big island and we caught the winds of Nihoa and we went all the way up the island chain uh, to Holaniku, uh, which is uh, the last atoll, also known as Kiri and we'll see it on a map on the next slide. Next slide. So here's um, a map of our archipelago. As you can see, um, we're quite vast, especially in relation and on context with the continental U.S. You can see how vast our archipelago is. We're also the remote, most remote island chain where the first islands are the most re remote aspect of our archipelago. So we have two designations listed um, on this map and the dotted lines that are closest to the islands is our 2006 original kind of monument designation that was from uh, President Bush. And then press E, and that's the uh, brighter white line that you see um, on there. I also want to note uh, Hawaiian names and place names are particularly important to us. Um, and so those are listed um, as well. Okay, next slide. So here we are at the furthest atoll. Um, at Holani Ku from the mele and the and the chant, as you might remember, um, Papa Hanamukuaikea is home to the largest tropical seabird rookery um, in all of the world, with a population of around 14 billion birds. Um, if you've ever spent any time in a seabird colony, um, and I hope you enjoyed it, but you'll find a familiarity with kind of the, the smell and the odor and also the, the chatter, right? Um, so I thought this picture kind of depicted that, that chatter that we feel when we're, when we're in this space. Um, next slide. Other marine systems, um, recent research of um, deep reefs. So you might have heard them um, uh, lately kind of mesophotic reef research looking at deep reefs as refugia 
um, and protections uh, for climate change, connectivity between species. Um, they've revealed for the Northwesterns that we have some of the highest endemism rates for the geographic range, these species only exist here in Hawaii. So this is a deep reef off of Midway. Uh, it's at Midway, it's about 95 plus uh, percent uh, endemism, but there are some areas in a, the archipelago up in the Northwestern that are at actually 100 percent. So literally every um, fish and organism that you're looking at is um, only found in Hawaii. Next slide. Um, so Hawaii is also the endangered species capital of the world. Um, Papahanaumokuakea provides habitat for endangered ducks, birds, seals, tur turtles, sorry. Also the abundance and densities of species is really noteworthy in this part of our island chain. Here we have a culturally important limpet. Um, this is opihi and it's really common at the graduation table, at a luau for weddings and it's harvested here in the main Hawaiian islands. Um, and it's harvested to the point where it's really difficult to, to find and especially not in these sort of uh, densities. So the populations in the Northwesterns um, also just help us visualize the impact of our extractive use in the main Hawaiian islands. Next slide. So our islands are also extremely important for our nation and our allies. Um, Midway Atoll and the Battle of Midway specifically was widely considered um, the turning point of the war in the Pacific. Next slide. Um, so from a conservation point of view, Papahanaumokuakea is a place of ecological and biophysical significance unique in the world. But within a cultural context, however, this area of our archipelago is the physical manifestation of that intersection between Po, or the realm of the gods, uh, primordial darkness, and then Ao, the realm of life, light. And as the westernmost place within our Hawaiian universe, many believe it's where we come from and then where we return to after death. So on the bottom left, you can see um, some ceremonial stone uprights, and perhaps you're familiar um, with, with others that are around the world, more famously Stonehenge or Easter Island. On the next slide, I'll point out kind of where they're situated on our island chain. So the Hawaiian archipelago is bifurcated by the Tropic of Cancer, and you can see it there in its um, Hawaiian name as well, Ke'ala Polokiva Akane. Um, and that is the line that distinguishes between the two worlds I was just mentioning, the immortal and then the mortal, Po and Ao. And those uprights depicted on the last slide, they're located on Moko Mana Mana. So if you look on the slide right below the big Po, um, you'll see Moko Mana Mana. And um, it's, it kind of makes sense that the, that the slides, uh, that the um, uprights will be there because that island has the highest concentration of ceremonial sites in the archipelago, and it actually sits exactly where the Tropic of Cancer goes through our island chain. Um, so we very much promote an ongoing activities conducted by Native Hawaiians and scholars and cultural practitioners in modern times now really get to reconnect um, to an understanding of ancestral knowledge. So. Um, we're seeing just reaffirmations of Hawaiian proverbs, and it really helps with a deeper understanding that can be applied to management decision-making archipelago-wide. Next slide. So as you can see with all of these amazing features that I've just kind of run through and um, many realms, these islands have attracted many protections over the years. All levels of government, bipartisan, you know, so Republican, Democrat, marine, terrestrial, historical, um, and we protect what we understand and then in turn what we value, right? So as these protections have evolved, our collective understanding has evolved and we've protected more and there's been more substance to each legislation and it's um, really hold in and perhaps has almost led to like a deeper remembering of this place. Next slide. 
so monument designation, as from our original map that I shared earlier, there's, there's two lines, and then expansion in 2016. They unite the federal, state, and local agencies to affect site implementation. Co-management is what we call it. So all the agencies with management and regulatory um, requirements for the site um, sit on a board. It's that third tier, the Monument Management Board, and we um, collaboratively make decisions for this place. So day-to-day -day decision making is made by that board. I also wanted to note that we actually reformed and changed some elements of this governance structure between the two designations. So originally in 2006, um, Office of Hawaiian Affairs uh, was not located at the co-trustee level, those top two tiers, and also the senior executive board. So that change was really affected um, after deep dialogue um, during the national and local conversation leading up to Obama's 2016 expansion action. It was requested by Office of Hawaiian Affairs and our governor, um, David Ige. Um, so the result really provided Native Hawaiians a voice on all levels of management, um, and including that high, those highest levels that really shape the policy and set the tone for them the day-to-day -day decision making. And this diversity of knowledge and perspective strengthens the context and essentially enhances every decision that the site makes. Next slide. So in 2010, with our World Heritage designation, our site is honored as a place among greats, and it's worthy of protecting for humankind as a whole. And we say that Papa Hanamokoi is the place for nature and um, it really helps share the inherent relatedness of our biodiversity in a cultural context. So our transdisciplinary uh, management approach deliberately focuses on honoring all these forms of knowledge. It incorporates science, culture, education, and community. Next slide. Next slide. Oh. So today is um, Papa Hanamakuakea, the original 2006 designation actually Sorry to interrupt, but you're you're a bit frozen. Sorry. Yeah, we can't. <laughs> I'm sorry. Sorry, anniversary, and I've been. Oh. <laughs> sorry. Um. Yeah. You you were really broken up there for a minute or so. So. If you just okay. want to um, start, we heard that it's the um, 2006, it was designated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so today is the 14th anniversary um, of that designation. And I've been reflecting a lot on the meaning of designations and the impact that they've had for our place. I've been thinking of, um, and, I, and I love that Lance actually put up the slide, those UN targets, um, but also our World Heritage Kuleana, and we're part of all these ne networks, um, so Marine World Heritage, large-scale MPAs, and then our own Kuleana to our own local place um, ourselves. So what does it mean when we as a community, local, national, global, enter a conversation and then decide to affirm values towards a particular place and our oceans globally? Next slide. Um, so these designations, and you know, for me, I feel like they've really afforded the co-trustees and the communities that we serve to really deepen our connection to our place. It's reconnection to our environment, to wayfinding routes, to building seasonal ecological calendars and engaging in partnerships that really add value and an understanding for our place because we're, we're at the table and we're committed. Next slide. Um, so these designations have not only had the ability to inspire local and archipelago arch action, but also with the use of iconic imagery, branding, and all these site relationships, we've had the ability to connect really broadly. And we have a community of support that follows Papa Hanamukweke and really, really cares about our place. 
um, we've been able to showcase the models of our work and stories from our site um, much broadly. Next slide. So earlier in my talk, I mentioned that PAPA really shows us to some degree that in the absence of lo local stressors, what our biodiversity could be. But she also teaches us that removing local stressors isn't enough. Um, our place is highly vulnerable to threats originating from beyond our shores. Here we see climate change, that's high intensity storm impact on the top left-hand side. Um, we see bleaching, if you look up on the right-hand corner, marine debris is impacting wildlife, um, invasive species. We have an algal mat currently at Pearl and Hermes, a species that was there and for whatever reason decided that um, the conditions were right for, for it to take over that reef. And then we have invasive ants as well. And then that's the underwater marine environment um, at that same atoll where uh, the hurricane kind of went through. And so on the left hand side, you see some imagery um, from not too long ago from um, the mid 2000s. It's actually part of our branding for our management plans in the late 2000s and an image of what it looked like after the storm. Okay, next slide. So all of these impacts have been deeply humbling for us as managers, for the broader community, and it's really gut-wrenching. So I don't know how else to really describe it. Um, we're managers of a place and the most highly protected area in pretty much the world. And well, seeing these impacts just feels like the solutions are just beyond the resource manager's toolkit. Um, I find myself just reflecting kind of from all perspectives and trying to look for solutions, looking for the bright spot, looking for that hope and just how to care for our place and, and build resilience in our oceans. So I know in kind of all ways right now and through these most recent sort of impacts at larger scale, Papa Hanamakuakea just continues to teach and challenge us. Next slide. So throughout the years, Papa has been reminding us as a collective to kind of, in my opinion, to just keep leveling up, um, to keep connecting, to keep deepening to our understanding in all forms and all ways of knowing for our places, keep weaving the traditional ideas with, with a modern today, with, um, and as a collective that we're really needed to work together to address the complex fa problems facing our ocean today. Our oceans are a direct reflection of the health of our own communities and our relationship to the natural world. Um, so I really appreciated hearing that earlier from Lance and I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. So when we move forward with protections and we're affirming that like moral obligation, those ethical obligations to as beings on this planet and we're re reprioritizing kind of our relationship in a way where we're understanding that we're a part of this natural world. Um, so with all these designations, I guess from my perspective, I want you to understand as a manager of this place for almost 10 years that they're not just the pinnacle, but they're an extremely important step along the way. And they catalyze resources and commitments to deepen our relationship and better care for our global oceans. And then post-designation, I just want to impress that site governance and thoughtful management implementation appropriate for your place um, within the social context of your place really, really matters. And in my experience, um, and even in you know this wonderful place that you know simplistically speaking is for Native Hawaiians their heaven, social equity has to be built, and then it has to be really tended to. Um, in order to really get it right, to be forward leaning. Um, so I'm inspired by the current global conversation and the actions and um, really humbled by the convergence of thought around social equity within now all our systems. And in particular, as we tackle some of these really complex problems um, 
that are relating to our oceans. Um, so I look forward to continuing all of this work together. I'm so happy to be here today. Um, so mahalo for all your interest and just for really caring about our oceans. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Maria. Thanks, Maria. Um, so we are going to get started with the Q&A. We have about five minutes for questions. Um, so let me open up the chat here. Um, so first question, um, I'll let you guys start asking them in the question box. Um, but I guess my first question for um, Maria or Tiara um, would be, um, what has been your favorite experience you know, being at these places um, with the wildlife or, or just what was sort of one of those most memorable moments for you guys? Uh, oh, I have to unmute you. I will uh, unmute, you, unmute you both. I'll let Tiare start just because I feel like I just spoke for a really long time. <laughs> okay, sure. Um, gosh, that is such a tough question because there are just so many. You know how how do you how do you pick one? Um, but I think you know I I would say in in general um, the experience that I've personally had. I haven't been to Papahanaumokuakea. Um, I worked with the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation to support that site um, for two years, but um, I have been to, um, you know, I, I, my mother is Palawan, my father's from San Francisco, and I grew up on the island of Maui and uh, spent a lot of my career working in Palau and other uh, Pacific areas. Um, and every time I get out to um, one of these areas, um, whether it's Jellyfish Lake, whether it's going out to um, discover the um, marine mammals that we never even really realized that we had in Palau. You know, for many years, I'll just share this with you, for, for many years in the conservation community, because of the politics associated with the topic, we kind of turned a little bit of a blind eye to the marine mammal issue. And then um, we started to realize that, oh my gosh, we have a resident population of sperm whales um, right here. We have so many, um, we, have, we, we did a research project and discovered that we have um, 15 species of marine mammals um, in Palau. And I'll tell you, there's one site, okay, this one comes to mind. There's one site that um, we discovered while we were doing the marine mammal surveys, and we now call it Baby Dolphin Bay. And it's in Palau, and it's this tiny little bay where um, if you go in at about two o'clock in the afternoon, um, and it's very secluded, you know, uh, boats travel past, but you don't really see a lot of you don't see any tourists there yet. If you go there about two o'clock in the afternoon, um, you'll see a, a group of about 200 um, spinner dolphins. Um, and about, um, I would say about a hundred of those are juveniles. And it is the most wonderful experience to go there at that time and, and, and in that large of a group. And because they, um, don't have uh, a lot of interaction with um, humans. They're still really curious. They're not. Um, they're not frightened at all. And you see these um, juvenile spinner dolphins practicing their jumps and their spins. And it is. It's so beautiful and so inspiring. So, yeah, that's just one that just comes to mind. <laughs> awesome. That is definitely a really awesome story. Um, <laughs> We have another question here from Jenna. Um, what can the average person do to help create, promote, and help MPAs other than voting for the right people? Um, so I um, can help take that one and then definitely um, would love to hear from Tiare. I know we're a little bit over, so I'm gonna just um, you know, take this question first and give people the action that we promised. Um, and then I would love to, if the panelists can stay on for a couple more minutes, answer a couple of questions, um, that would be great. 
Um, so first, thank you all for hopping on and learning more about marine protected areas and our need to protect more of our oceans. Um, obviously, if we are going to move forward here in the US with protecting more of our oceans, our decision makers need to hear from the public. So that's why we're going to be asking people to sign a pledge of support showing um, you know, our decision makers and everyone else that you are standing with us to help protect more of our oceans. So I'll be putting that in the chat um, while TRA picks sort of her answer, um, but I urge you to sign our petition um, and our pledge and that will help us um, in the future advocate for more protections. Um, so TRA, you wanna? Hey, did, did, okay, did, would you like me to answer it or did you wanna take this one, Maria? Or since I answered the last one? I'm happy. Sure. Okay. Sure, or um, I, I just think connecting to your shoreline or adopting an area where you know you really care about and getting to know it and understand the changes that are happening with it and really sharing your story. Um, definitely, you know, connecting with Environment America that will obviously keep you kind of up to date on on things that could require more collaborative kind of public action in in the policy realm is is really helpful in MCI as as well. But I think I think when we connect to these places and can really tell our truth about it, there's there's no greater power than that. Yeah, definitely. Um, I definitely think storytelling is a huge part of of make of advocating for protecting places. Um, Lance, I also know you have a specific action that you guys have been working on at MCI with scientists. If you want to talk a little bit about that. Oh, I have to unmute you. Sorry about that. <laughs> Yeah, I, we have often uh, worked with the science community to have help them have their voices heard in these um, conversations and have scientist letters. But I, I also would say that um, whether it's Environment America or ourselves, there are a number of um, petitions that are out there right now, especially for the New England Seamounts and Canyons, um, one done through the National Ocean Protection Coalition. Um, we've also been advocating for protection for the seamounts off California. So you can uh, look for a petition there and take a sea mountaineer pledge, which uh, really is like wilderness pledge, right? We're going to tread lightly on the ocean and work to help uh, protect. But I think at the end of the day, the, the initial comment, you know, get in touch with your uh, elected officials and tell them that you value the ocean and is, is the biggest uh, step you really can make. And, you know, there's a lot of national legislation out there right now, and, and you could certainly weigh in. Um, throughout the United States on that. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then the other, the, fi the final question that I think we'll talk, um, talk about here is, we got a question about the Northeast Canyons and Seamounts Marine National Monument and how people can take action um, to protect that place. Um, definitely, um, we have a petition that we can send around um, after this event um, from Environment America. And I know that um, MCI and others have been organizing around this issue as well. So definitely signing those petitions is a great first step. Um, you know, having, pushing back against this decision is, is really important. And we also know that um, over the next few months, um, there will be opportunities okay. to weigh in with your elected officials, um, as well as with the administration. So we, we urge you to keep your eye out, um, join, our, join our email list, um, and look at these other organizations as well. Um, and, and hopefully we'll be able to um, regain protections for the Northeast Canyons and Seamounts. I would also say, if I could just add really quickly, you know, visiting your coast and ocean and, you know, demonstrating that you value it and support the local communities there is uh, probably the most important thing you can really do. Um, be a good steward and be out there and participate in, in nature. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. Well, thanks for everyone for coming and attending and thanks to all of our panelists for um, sharing their experiences and their expertise. Um, I think this is a really awesome webinar and I look forward to being in touch with everyone about ways we can move forward and protect more of our oceans in the future. Thanks Great. to everyone for- uh, Much aloha. Yeah. Bye. Aloha, thank you guys.